Friday before week 16 of the National Football League gets into full swing. The Friday before Christmas and the Friday uh, on planet Earth in which we don't have Dick Enberg calling anything anymore. No more of his podcast, no more great moments because the legendary voice passed away It is home in La Jolla, California, uh, yesterday at the age of 82. And, uh, I, I mean, we could go through his resume. It would take a very long time, it but I, I'm about to read it off for you, okay? 42 NFL seasons, 10 Super Bowls, 28 Wimbledons, 23 French Opens, 15 NCAA basketball title games, eight NCAA tournament title games. He called locally here in Los Angeles, the UCLA John Wooden years. Dick Enberg was the voice of those for many of those years before handing the microphone off to Al Michaels. He also called that legendary Houston-UCLA game in the Astrodome many, many moons ago in 1968 when there was really no such thing as event television for regular season action, okay? There was no, hey, everybody, let's all gather in a football stadium for a basketball game, which is... Absolutely, in this day and age, something nobody bats an eye with at because how many NCAA tournament Final Fours are now held in football stadiums? All of them. So this was quite an event, and it was made for television event put together by a group of television executives who had an idea, and who was the guy that they decided to put at the microphone, a young broadcaster that was very well known in Southern California named Dick Enberg. 12 United States Open Tennis Championships, and I am honored and pleased to say that that is where I got to work with Dick Ember. When I when I left the worldwide leader in sports, when we parted ways, um, on my honeymoon with Suze, uh, on which I signed my contract for the NFL Network in Venice, <laughs> got a call later on on our honeymoon from my agent saying, CBS would like for you to do some events at the U.S. Open in New York City. And I would do the late night highlight show and then whenever there was a big event out in the grandstand, which is kind of like the Cameron Indoor of tennis. I mean, it's this cauldron of a small, or for the smallest facility that's not an outer court, if you will, at the uh, at the great tennis center in, in Queens, in Flushing Meadow, New York. And that's when I first got to meet Dick Enberg. And he could not have been nicer to that sports center guy that had no tennis history professionally at all, could not have welcomed me more with open arms. And after the first couple of years doing it, for my third year there, I asked CBS, would it be okay if I called a match at center court? Now, I, I don't know the answer to this, what I'm about to tell you, but I, I just wanted to assure myself of calling an event. That's it. I was doing the late night highlight show that was between Letterman and Kilbourne at the time, and I asked CBS, hey, look, can I just assure myself that I'm going to call a match? Just one. And the only way I could be assured of calling a match is if it was on center court, the main Ash Stadium, um, the Saturday of Labor Day weekend, the middle weekend, the first weekend of, of, the, turn of the tennis tournament, which meant they would have to call Dick Enberg and say, you're not calling that. Now, I think it was Lindsay Davenport mopped the floor with some poor... Uh, lady right. she in about year. in about 20 minutes okay so I'm sure it was no skin off his nose to just and and, and it's a long day for me I had two other matches after that I'm sure I'd, I'd like to think I never had a conversation with him about it but there was never any issue and I think there might be some other people in this industry who'd be like that's you know I'm I'm Dick Enberg that's this is the, I'm the voice of the U.S. Open on CBS I've who the heck is this kid? I've called 28 Wimbledons. <laughs> and honestly, every time I met him, every time I saw him, 
He could not have been more generous, um, left some of his notes in the booth up there, just in case it was something wow. that, I, I mean, I, I, I have nothing but pure affection. And then when you get to meet somebody who you grew up watching, okay, grew up watching him call the fumble, the drive, because he was the voice of NBC football for two decades, and they had the AFC package for many, many years. So the Elway years wow. in the 80s, he would call. Uh, the Bengals years. As a matter of fact, you know, um, he called the Bengals 49ers Super Bowl, the second one. And of his 10 Super Bowls, uh, growing up and watching Super Bowl 15, the first one that he called for NBC alongside Merlin Olsen, who I grew up thinking was Father Murphy. I'll be very honest with you. I mean, I'm just I'm dating myself here, right? <laughs> that was the Plunkett MVP Super Bowl, beating Dick Vermeil's Eagles. Uh, called Super Bowl 17. That was the one where John Riggins went off for the Redskins against the Dolphins. Right. He called Super Bowl 20, which was the Bears handing the ball off to the fridge moment where they destroyed Raymond Berry's coached Patriots. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of these in the Superdome. Um, then he called Super Bowl 23, Montana to Taylor with no time left for the Niners to deny the Bengals for a second time in the big game on the biggest stage. Cowboys fans of the triplets, all three of the triplet Super Bowls, Super Bowl 27, Super Bowl 28, Super Bowl 30, the two blowouts of the Bills, and then the Larry Brown tormenting of Neil O'Donnell, all of them called by Dick Enberg, whose last game at the microphone was for NBC in San Diego, where so many fans know about this this genial genius from Mount Clemens, Michigan. He's a Central Michigan Chippewa, a Michigander through and through, and it would come through in his work, his sensibilities, his Midwestern sensibilities, and his affable nature, and his signature call of, oh, my. Think about that. Just a simple, oh, my. Great call. That's all you needed it's to so hear. Great. And every single time you'd hear it, you could think in this day and age, it's like, oh, he's planned his oh my, right? Everybody thinks that their signature call is something planned. It always came out of his mouth as if it was a genuine reaction to the remarkable events playing out in front of him that he was describing, whether it was on the radio or enhancing if it was on television, that we were all witnessing with him side by side. And, but in San Diego, where he called Padres games for so many years, and the folks in Southern California have known him for decades, his last Super Bowl was in San Diego when San Diego native Terrell Davis shocked the Packers, who essentially let, if you remember, the Broncos score so they could get the ball back for a potential Brett Favre game-tying touchdown. That was Super Bowl 32. Ten Super Bowls. He had a piece in calling, 10 of them. Oh, yeah, nine Rose Bowls, four Olympic games. <laughs> we could keep going on and on. California Angels games, Los Angeles Rams games, UCLA basketball, as I mentioned. Indiana Hoosiers football and basketball. That's how he really got his big break in 1957 to 61. 11 years with CBS, 25 years with NBC. And then when ESPN began to get more and more of the tennis packages they invited him into the worldwide leader tent and so many f of my f colleagues that you could see on their twitter feed today chris fowler being one of them got to meet him and touch him and be around him and learn from him and revere him uh for all those years with espn for more rich eisen show tune to audience channel 239 on direct tv or download the rich eisen show app